All right, so it looks like we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am Stephanie Pedrosa, Senior Marketing Manager at Oregon Software Technologies, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today in Oregon's webinar series. And we've been hosting these educational webinars for over a year, so I want to thank everyone who's joining us and thank you all for your continued support. A little bit about Orego, we've been helping capital owners manage their infrastructure programs for over two decades. And in today's webinar, we're gonna discuss a topic that's quite timely, but also has been top of mind for many public agencies. As we all know, supply chain disruptions have been an ongoing problem for many years, and sadly, it's only gotten worse since the pandemic. And as many of us know, our country really relies heavily on freight transportation, and many public agencies rely on flight transportation to obtain equipment and supplies needed to execute their current projects. And in today's webinar, industry leaders will share how they have managed these risks and what steps they've taken to minimize capital program difficulties. A few quick notes before we get started. The webinar is recorded and we will provide all registered participants with the recording. The slides will also be provided to all registered participants. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to submit them via the Q&A chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. If we don't answer all the questions during the available time, we will follow up with you via email. And joining me today is my colleague and marketing director, Richard Kramer, who is our marketing director at Orgo Software. So, and we'll also be moderating today's webinar. Hello, Richard. Hi, Stephanie, great to be here. Awesome. And we are going to launch a quick poll question and let us know if you can see it, just because we want to get to know who's in our audience. And the question is, which of the following best describes your organization? Um, are you a part of like roads and bridges, water and wastewater, trains and transit, broadband, electric grid and green energy, or other? So if you don't mind taking a couple of seconds to answer those questions. <clears throat> And let's see if we have current results. Okay. All right, great to see a lot of folks from water and wastewater here with us today. That's great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, well, welcome everyone. And now the next question, which of the following best describes your role? We have fear in project management, part of capital planning and finance, engineering, consultant, admin, or other. And we'll just give it a couple of seconds. <clears throat> okay, several project managers, a, lot of, a couple of consultants and engineers. All right. Well, thank you, yeah, everyone. Nice, nice well, mix. That's usually what we get. Yeah. Well, we'll go on. And now I'm really, ex really excited to introduce our panel of experts. Joining us today, we have Mike Tooley, who's the former head of Montana Department of Transportation and industry lead at Orego. And he brings decades of experience directing public sector agencies, where he focused on the modernization of Montana DOT's internal infrastructure, making transportation programs more efficient and effective for the state. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And next, we have Dr. Ann Schneider, who's the former secretary of Illinois Department of Transportation, who also brings decades of experience in public finance, policy, and solution development. As a secretary for the state of Illinois, she directed the emphasis on freight and multimodal transportation planning and solutions, including efforts to bring commercial navigation back to Illinois DOT. She also so served as the initial chair of freight advisory committee at USDOT, where she worked with public and private freight stakeholders from across the nation to develop recommendations for initial draft of National Freight Strategic Plan. Dr. Schneider, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks. And now I'll pass it on over to Richard. Thank you very much, Stephanie. 
Um, very warm welcome uh, from me uh, to everybody in the audience, uh, wherever you are. Thanks very much for joining us as we take a, a deep dive into some of these issues surrounding supply chain management uh, in our uh, infrastructure and facilities world. I've seen this, this topic come up at a, at a couple of conferences that I've uh, been to already this year. Uh, it's a concern that we hear from our customers from, from time to time. And I remember, I think it was around about December last year, there was a, a 60 Minutes feature um, that you can find on YouTube that focused on the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach and talking about how disruptive everything was. There was like 80 ships out in the bay that were just sort of waiting there to deliver their cargo and they, they couldn't do it because there was no way to put the cargo once they, they got in. And that really opened my eyes to the sort of the scale of the problem. Although I think as we all know, it's it's been going on for quite a, quite a while as, as Stephanie said. So I think it's a complicated topic. It's involving more than one cause and, and multiple knock-on effects. And um, so I'm very excited to hear from uh, Anne and Mike uh, as they as they break it down for us. Um, I think we have one more poll question just before we jump in. And we're curious to hear from our audience members, you know, how much have you been impacted by supply chain in, uh, issues? Uh, what, what's been the, the, the biggest impact for you? Is it an increase in the supply cost? Is it the delays? Um, or is it just the, the fact that you can't find the materials that you need and you're having to switch materials or something like that, which has been the, uh, the biggest issue? And we'll give you folks a, a few seconds to answer and then we'll move on. All right, keep them coming. Yeah. All right. Let's have a look here. All right. So it looks like most of the audience is saying delays with, with cost in second place. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, folks. Okay. So, uh, as I said, sort of a multifaceted problem. And we wanted to hear from uh, Mike and Anne. Uh, I guess just you know, lay lay it out for us. And uh, Anne, I'm I'm going to start uh, with you. Give us your take on on what we're seeing in the industry. What are you hearing from folks saying about about this uh, you know major disruption that we're facing? Thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, a lot of this began as everybody on this webinar probably knows during the pandemic and you know, there was significant amount of labor shortages, not only here in the US, but around the world. And so a lot of the supply chain suffered because um, manufacturers of goods were shutting down. Um, and then the transport of those goods was also experiencing, um, as Richard mentioned, some significant delays. And we saw what happened at LA Long Beach. And we're seeing that replicated a little bit also on the East Coast at Savannah and even up into New York and New Jersey. Um, maybe um, some to a lesser degree on the Gulf Coast. Um, but that all brought together um, the problems that we're now facing, those supply shortages that resulted from those supply chain hiccups, or really, uh, I would say, supply chain meltdown more than hiccup, um, are really driving the increasing prices that we're seeing and also the delay in getting those goods to where they need to be. Um, here in the Midwest, I'm in Illinois and around the Chicago area, there's significant amount of um, the nation's rail traffic goes through Chicago. And what we're seeing here is a shortage in um, containers which carry consumer goods all the way up to agricultural products and other um, products that can fit into a container. And that's also impacting your bulk goods. Um, and so those are the things that spill over into the infrastructure sector and create these shortages that we're experiencing. Um, I think on the slide here, you also talk, there's some issues around labor shortages around the supply chain operations. Everybody, I think, has talked about the truck driver shortage. I both served on the National Freight Advisory Committee back in 2013, 2014 timeframe. And then we were, were talking about it back in 
from years, and we are eight, nine years later, and we're still experiencing the truck driver shortage, and I think that's been exacerbated by what's been going on. Um, that brought together, um, I think we've seen that spill over into what we're experiencing in the infrastructure sector. So I, I know here, in the, like I mentioned here in the Midwest, uh, I'm working with some folks that are letting projects, and I know structural steel right now has 13 month lead time. So we're, we're seeing those significant delays that are slowing down projects. And then with the inflationary pressures, we're seeing a lot of projects that are having difficulty. So the supply chain issue is really front and center and front of mind. And, and as people look to Washington and, and they look also to their state capitals for solutions. You know, this, this is something that everybody, um, we're all in on and trying to figure out what the next path is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, to make an obvious point, the, the problem with the supply chain is that it's a it's a chain, right? So as, it, often the issues are not, uh, you know, limited to just one part of that chain. There's, you know, that you can't get the goods into the port because you can't get the goods out of the port. And that's and that's the, the, the rail and the, the, the truck driver issue. And then that has knock on effects to other parts of the, the, the labor pool. Um, so it's a, it's a tough one. Um, Mike, what, uh, what, what are you hearing from your perspective about this, this whole big hairy problem? Yeah, it, it is a big problem, Richard. And uh, it's been out there a long time. I think COVID just magnified it times 20, frankly. Uh, and when I think of supply chain, I actually think more of like a web, right? I mean, it's a, uh, it, it, it isn't, a to B or A to Z. It's it's a lot more complicated than that. And so, you know, pre-COVID, uh, there was a story that was told to me by a uh, consultant that I know uh, about freight that would come in from the port of Long Beach or, or LA. Uh, and it would take, uh, if it went by rail, it would take about four days to get to Chicago. And then when it got to Chicago, it'd take about four days in Chicago and before it could transfer. Uh, transport to the East Coast. And I think right now we miss those days, frankly, because uh, it's, it is a lot more exacerbated than that. And for all these various um, factors, uh, the cost increases, the labor shortages, uh, COVID just exacerbated that uh, to uh, the nth degree. And um, we still have a lack of communication between the stakeholders and the modes, frankly. Uh, the modes of transportation are an issue. Uh, they they do have a, a lack of communication between them and coordination, and 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 sometimes competition. I think uh, Ann and I saw that when we sat on the National Freight Advisory Committee. The interests that that came out between trucking and rail uh, that that really, if we could work together, we could solve some of these issues. So those are a lot of the trends that I've seen. Um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, COVID just brought it home for all of us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Richard, uh, I, if, I could, if, yeah. if I could, if I could, just to, to build off of what Mike was saying, um, it, it there is a lack of visibility into the supply chain. And I know that's been an issue for a long time. And there have been efforts through that visibility into the supply chain, because as Mike mentioned, you know, it, it, the modal handoffs, are difficult. And so, you know, we're looking for solutions around creating that transparency to see what is happening in the marketplace so that we can track these goods better and figure out where those choke points really are. Because right now you just got a lot of finger pointing, you know, the railroads are blaming the ocean carriers, the ocean carriers are blaming the truck drivers that do the dredge, um, you know, the ports are blaming um, somebody else. So it, there's a lot of finger pointing but I think with increased visibility, we can really get a better handle on where those choke points are. Yeah, that, that and that's a great point. That's something I noticed just you know in doing my research was, yeah, the the, the finger pointing. This not an easy way to say it. And uh, uh, at the at the end of the day, it's it's the person at the end of that supply chain. So your end user in 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 our world, your constituent that's waiting for that infrastructure, or what have you that. Uh, gets impacted the most. Um, so absolutely. Um, this um, article, by the way, is uh, from a CNBC 
um, article that was written kind of focusing on the congestion in the ports uh, particularly. Um, but yeah, the, the, the tracking issue is, is um, a major one as well. And as I said, it's all kind of interrelated, which makes it a, a tough one to, uh, to, to crack. But um, that's actually a good sort of segue into our next um, topic of discussion, which is about collaborating with uh, the right stakeholders. And I guess how you can improve your chances of uh, success by, by working with the right people. Um, folks are having to get a little creative, I think, to try and solve these issues. Um, I read another article about a different industry, but, but how large retailers like Amazon are really uh, starting to build their own fleets of ships and, and, and airplanes to take over more of that, that supply chain. And Amazon's like one of the top, 10 biggest shipping companies in the world now, which you, you maybe wouldn't think, think about. Um, so Mike, what, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, who, who can agencies lean on um, and how can they work either with, with uh, you know, sister agencies or other folks in the ecosystem to, to really get better outcomes over the next few years? That's a good question, Richard, and thank you for asking it. Um, I, I'm looking at the slide, and, and one thing that we need to realize is that uh, different modes, different technologies, right? They're not coordinated. Uh, they don't have uh, interoperability uh, amongst them. So going back to uh, Anne's uh, comments earlier, uh, it's it, that is one of the main issues in trying to get visibility into the into the problem, right? They're all speaking different languages. And, and it isn't coordinated. It's, uh, it's going to take quite a bit of work to uh, accomplish that. Uh, the private sector now, uh, Amazon being a great example, has just decided to go their own way. Uh, they, they could see the issues and they're going to solve them for themselves, uh, frankly. And, and it will be, at least for them, uh, they're going to increase their freight velocity. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more to, to do than just that. I mean, uh, Amazon, I don't expect to see them getting involved in in uh, shipping concrete girders or steel for bridges, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they'll, solve, mm -hmm. they'll solve some of the issues for their customers, which will be great and maybe ultimately relieve some pressure on the supply chain. But right now, uh, for us in this industry, uh, it's very real and Amazon can't solve it. Uh, one of the big things that uh, I ran into during my time at the Department of Transportation was uh, interstate cooperation and as far as, uh, I guess, policy and law regulation and, and, and harmonization, frankly, across the states uh, in terms of truck size and weight. Uh, every state uh, has the power to regulate to some extent what... Uh, they do what they allow on their portion of the transportation system and it's mm -hmm. disjointed. Uh, so for example, Montana can uh, permit up to 106,000 pounds, uh, Idaho somewhat less than that. So that puts a, uh, somebody trying to, to bring those uh, construction related materials in, into a uh, interesting uh, quandary, right? Uh, they would like to bring as much as they can on one trip and, and, and make it as effective as possible. But uh, interstate cooperation is in, incredibly important. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. I know Anne has a lot to add. Yeah, Anne, what are your thoughts on, on who to work with and who you can reach out to to, to get better outcomes for your constituents? the interstate um, issue and the lack of harmonization um, amongst just the various states. Um, recently, I participated in a supply chain resiliency exercise. It's a national exercise, but one of the things that came out of that is um, 11 Midwestern states, it's the states that make up the Mid-America Association of State Transportation Officials. So that's the umbrella organization for state DOTs and each region has their own umbrella group. Um, and then there's the national group. But the ones here in the Midwest, and it's called MASTO, they recently entered into an agreement, an emergency only. So it would have to be an emergency declared by the president. Um, they have all agreed to um, a certain amount of weight that can travel on the 11 state roadways. So you don't have those um, jurisdictional issues when you cross boundaries. 
and this, like I said, it's only during an emergency, but it is a model um, for addressing um, those su supply chain shortages, um, particularly when we're in a national emergency, um, to, to harmonize those policies, to make it easier for the truck driving industry to get to where they need to be, so help get those goods to where they need to be. So that's just one example of um, that harmonization. And it's not just amongst the states, it's also harmonization you know, globally. Um, and so I, I think that there's been a lot of discussion around um, shipping reforms um, to try to make things uniform. Um, and that would hopefully make things um, move better through that supply chain. Um, one thing on this slide, it talks about increasing private sector freight stakeholder participation in transportation planning. There's been a big effort through these state freight advisory committees to do just that, to get the private sector involved so that they can express to the public sector where they think the issues are. You know, we really need to hear from the shippers out there. Where do you have problems? What, what part of the transportation system is broke or what part isn't working well for you? Um, it's, it's when we get that participation from the private sector, from, from the people that are dependent upon the transportation system that we can get a better understanding of where those choke points are. And then if there are any public sector solutions like the one with the mass tow that I just talked about that, that, that the public sector can bring to bear to address some of those issues. Um, the, the problem with um, trying to get the private sector, particularly in the freight industry involved is that they're very busy people. And um, if it's too much of the same thing over and over again, I think they get burned out. So we've got to figure out as public sector um, advisors and, and as public sector participants, how can we make it a value add for those people to get involved in the planning efforts so that we can address these issues? Um, really, because if we don't, we're going to see this repeat itself where the supply chain breaks down. You all of a sudden can't move because um, for whatever reason, the modes of transportation are talking, they're not moving things, and so you see contract prices going up, and then it costs a lot more to move goods, and then you see this inflation on the back end of that. So, you know, I think it's really important for us to try to figure out as public sector participants to, to how to engage with those private stakeholders. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that struck me, maybe a lot of other people as well, just how fragile the kind of system is. Because as again, it's all interconnected. So if you change one part of it, it has this huge knock on effect. And then when you bring inflation into the discussion, like you said, that can just be like a vicious cycle because it just drives things um, just just round and round. And you end up um, just get paying paying higher costs that seem like they're, they're, they're never going to end. Um, thanks for mentioning um, Masto and Ashto, by the way. I'll, I'll just give a bit of a shout out that um, Stephanie and I, and I think Mike as well, we're going to be at the Ashto annual conference uh, in a couple of months in Orlando. So uh, if you're going and anyone in the audience, if you see us there, please stop by and say hi. We'd love to, to meet you. Um, great organization that we're, we're um, very proud to, to work with. Um, good. I think uh, we have another poll question coming up. So we asked about... Uh, here we are. We asked about, uh, you know, cost versus delays versus substitution, I guess. Um, we wondering, like, in the last three to six months, say this year, you know, how big an issue uh, has this, in terms of the actual projects you're delivering, how, how big has this been? Is it, is it sort of a minor change? Is it significant or is it not really affecting you? Um, just curious, would you describe it as, as a significant impact to your projects, minor or not really affecting you? Um, and we'll wait for folks to um, to answer. Give them a couple of uh, seconds here. Um, you know, the issue with with I think we, uh, we all understand with the, with the cost and the it's like a project funding. With the, the cost and the schedule, you can try to get those things in quicker uh, so that it doesn't impact your your schedule. But from what I've seen, then the costs just go up the roof uh, through the roof. I've I've seen. A couple of stats that like shipping costs are up um, by, you know, 10 times what they were, um, you know, even just 18 months ago. Um, and, and at the same time, there's been, uh, you know, I'm not in the industry, so I don't know, but like the shipping industry is making record profits. So there's a bit of a question about how, how motivated they are to change things. 
Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's complex. Um, all right, uh, let's have a look here. So about two thirds of folks saying significant, with the another third saying at least some impact. All right, great. We are seeing your uh, your questions come in on the Q and A box, folks. So we will have time to to get to questions with our panelists at the end. So please uh, please keep the, uh, those coming in. All right. So let's you know ultimately you know let's talk about some other ideas that that'll help our audience keep their their initiatives moving because at the end of the day we're we're all under pressure to to get those projects done on time and on budget even if there's uh, circumstances beyond our control that sometimes makes that a little unrealistic um but what what would you be thinking as an agency executive what advice would you give to to your folks on the ground about still getting your your program delivered successfully um, uh, uh, for your constituents. Um, Anne, I'll start with you. Um, one thing that I think is really important um, in, in dealing with this is being transparent within your organization about what's happening. So because of the inflationary pressures, I know, for instance, um, here, like I mentioned, I'm in Illinois. So here in Illinois, um, a lot of our bid lettings now um, are averaging 20 to 40 percent over the engineer's estimate. Um, I think when they're in the lower range of that 20 to 40 percent, then the, the, the DOT is going ahead with those projects, even though um, their typical policy is not to um, award projects that are outside of the 5%, 5 percent, five to ten percent range, but they 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 understand that schedule is really important. So they're moving those projects forward. And what's happening with the other projects is they're having to be um, drawn out um, further. So I think figuring out how to work within this uncertainty um, and being flexible and doing your um, project delivery is really important in order to be able to deliver the programs that um, as public sector providers of infrastructure, you, you have to adjust to some of these supply chain challenges. And I think one of the big things, um, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, is visibility and, and working, um, you know, using technology to your advantage to try to open up that visibility so you can get a better view into where those issues are, and then you can develop strategies um, to address those issues. I think another thing um, that I would tell folks is that, you know, always have that plan B in place. And I've seen some of the comments that was coming um, through the chat box. And I, I think, you know, understanding where you can maybe switch out materials, where you have some flexibility in your specifications, so that you can keep those projects moving forward and, and they're not facing additional inflationary pressures as you're going forward. So I think the main thing is to, to convey to your people that they need to be flexible. These policies are in place for a very good reason. And I know a lot of state DOTs um, uh, do not like to break precedent because um, they can get into some issues down the road if they do. But I think I think they have to weigh that with the with being flexible and able to in order to be able to deliver these programs um, effectively and efficiently. Yeah, I um, another thing I read was it was it was in the healthcare industry it was around how folks are bidding on their pro it was one health system that is now requiring their contractors when they actually submit the bid to do sort of a materials risk assessment. And say, how likely is it that this material is not going to be available? And if it hits a certain level, they have to actually provide um, alternatives and with a, with a similar sort of. So, so just really taking a deep dive before the project even hits the ground um, on 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 essentially a, a plan B for 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 all the materials. So, yep, de I'm definitely seeing that as well. Um, Mike, what do you think in your experience? Um, what else can agencies do to to sort of minimize the risk and the disruption? Right. Well, I think Ann hit on a lot of it. Uh, when we were planning in the good old days, pre-COVID, uh, the main focus was not so much materials, but funding. 
right? So our five-year plans mm. were were basically needing to be fiscally constrained, and the big unknown was uh, will the the uh, gas tax fund stay solvent? Will federal highways have to go into uh, some, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but anyway, uh, where, where they have to basically portion out the funding a little bit differently, uh, the reimbursements would be slower. So it was all fiscally focused, uh, but now I think uh, for planning, it's a lot more complicated than that. And planning has always been a lot more complicated than that. Planners are very good at this, but they really need to spend a lot more time on planning for what ifs. I mean, uh, sit back, take a look. We've got a couple of years of experience now. Uh, take that data and and put in the what if scenarios. Okay, what if uh, my steel is simply not available? Is there some other way I can still construct this project? Uh, what if uh, I have no accessibility or not enough accessibility to lumber, uh, which is an overlooked part of uh, highway construction in particular, uh, you know, what if, and, and just construct those what if scenarios uh, in such a way that it still uh, protects your critical timeline the best you can and still deliver those projects. Um, labor, again, is mentioned here on this slide. That's a big deal. We all saw the gray wave coming. Uh, and then COVID just uh, created a whole new issue with the uh, great resignation. So you don't have the labor, you don't have the carpenters, you don't have the truck drivers, you don't have, so how do you manage that uh, in, in in this kind of a scenario? And then uh, finally, I mean, obviously we'd love to be able to predict freight travel times or velocity. Um, Canada has done a pretty good job at that. They're, they have a pretty good uh, system at, in, at predicting um, uh, the, the throughput of their system. Uh, they are totally different than not, we are in terms of regulation and, and uh, intermodal cooperation. Um, we can learn some things from Canada, frankly. Uh, and then finally, uh, supply chain uh, with accurate stakeholders with accurate information. I would like to add to that, though. That's great, but it needs to be predictable. Um, that's equally as important if, is to have predictable information as to when your materials arrive. Because uh, the project managers I've worked with, uh, if they if they know what is going to happen, they can deliver uh, miraculous results. Uh, they're very good at planning around various contingencies if they just have predictable and accurate information. Yeah, very good. I wonder if I could drill down just on one point you made, Mike, because we get asked about it all the time, which is, and I think it's something that's sometimes overlooked or we don't talk about enough. And that's just the, the labor side of things, because I think it's it seems like I don't know if it's true, it seems like it's becoming harder and harder to uh, retain really good folks um, in, in, in the public sector. Um, and so when, whenever you have uh, a process that requires you know, flexibility and, you, and creative thinking, it really the, the better your people are and the more experienced they are, the better chance you have of. Of making it through that um, with, with you know, not being too badly affected by it. What what are some of the things you did when when you were head of, of Montana and the other agencies in Montana you were head of to um, to really attract and retain the, the the best talent? Something that's just become exacerbated since the the pandemic and the resignation and now with these supply chain issues. Well, some of the things that we did, of course, you always have pay is the first thing that comes up, uh, but it's not the only factor in job satisfaction. Um, giving people uh, the authority, the flexibility to do their jobs, basically hand them the problem and step back um, and let them solve it. People are very good at that. I was talking about that a moment ago about project managers. That's a perfect example. Uh, just say, hey, we need this uh, bridge built. And then, uh, you know, here's here's the specifications and, and just let them figure out how to do it. They'll do it uh, with your support. Uh, something else, technology, uh, the the newer generation really likes that. Uh, they, they want the newest and, and uh, coolest bells and whistles uh, that attracts folks. If you if you have an organization that is technologically savvy decently funded, um, 
has a re, has a reputation of being a fun place to work, and you can actually see results of what you do. Uh, you can recruit and retain some some uh, people a little bit easier, in my opinion, at least as far as people go. Some of the other issues, though, so uh, assume you don't get enough people to, uh, and that's just the transportation agency side. If you don't have enough people uh, on, say, the transportation side, uh, we're seeing technologies uh, becoming uh, more frequent now, uh, such as uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen uh, in my own state autonomous trains. Uh, there, there is a train that runs uh, between the U.S. and Canadian border that brings lumber into Montana. Uh, on a regular basis. And, and so now you don't need the engineer, right? That you can't recruit anyway. Um, mm. that, that steps into some areas that, that make people a little bit nervous because remember I talked about the various constituencies and their concerns. Um, labor does not want, uh, is, gets nervous about those types of technologies, uh, to replace, uh, people. Um, but, but in reality, the people aren't, there. So maybe we need to take a closer look at those type of technologies to get the materials to where they need to be. Yeah, very good. We could probably do a whole webinar just on that um, on that topic. Actually, I was going to ask Anne the just to give us her thoughts, but I she we she might have a connection issue. I think she might have uh, dropped off. We'll see if she uh, she comes back. Um, so I, I I think folks, if you have any other questions, I'm seeing a lot of chat in, in my bottom window here. Please keep mm -hmm. them coming in. Um, I'm going to hand uh, back to Stephanie now just to go through uh, some of those questions and uh, maybe cover them with, uh, with Mike. Yeah. So the first question that came around earlier, it was, um, I guess, with she read an article on high transportation industry um, or high transportation increases. Example, $1,500 per container pre covid and now it's 20,000. So with crisis or with prices increasing a lot, what are your thoughts on surcharges and on what it is now and do you think that's going to be an upcoming norm? Do you kind of foresee that getting better in surcharges increases or do you see that worsening? I think that's probably the question that's being asked here. Well, well, what you're seeing, it, it's it's the old, uh, you know, the the basic uh, economic thing, uh, supply and demand, right? Um, and and so you don't have the containers available to move things like you used to for a number of reasons, and and now they're ten or more times the cost they used to be. Do I see that changing? Yes, I think it has to come down. Um, otherwise, um, you're going to see the the amazons and and others step in and and change the game frankly it it, it could be a disruptor uh, but it takes so long that in the meantime those of us that are responsible for uh public infrastructure uh, construction and maintenance are are going to to be facing these kinds of issues uh the surcharges um you know i i really don't know how that would work into uh uh, transportation program, given uh, the constraints that you have placed upon you uh, by federal highways and other organizations that manage the funding for us. But uh, yeah, I think I think things are going to eventually have to come down. But but right now, um, that's that's the reality. All right. Well, thank you. And then the next question is, um, Anne was mentioning that we should have more private sector participation. How can we involve the private sector? And then also, wouldn't that kind of be an inconvenience working with your contractors? Because would, wouldn't you think that they would want to save their trade secrets for change orders? I don't know if that makes sense. Can you guys hear me now? I'm sorry. Yeah, we can. <laughs> I yes, had we can. technical problems. Okay, I apologize. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and when I when I talked about involving getting involved with the private sector, I was really talking about those state freight advisory committees where you bring in the shippers and you start talking to them about where their choke points are. But I think you raise a really good point 
I think partnership is really critical for um, us to be able to deliver these infrastructure projects. So there needs to be a partnership with your contracting community. It needs to be partnership with your engineering community. Um, and you need to be able to find out from them where they are seeing um, these issues. And I know a lot of state procurement laws are really um, touchy about some of that um, conversation. So you just need to figure out, I think, um, and Mike mentioned, you know, doing some of that like scenario planning internally um, before you reach out to the to the private sector partners that you work with um, to see how you can alleviate some of those supply chain choke points. The other thing is working with your engineering community. You know, they need to be able to have the the, the flexibility. Sometimes, as state DOTs, we specify things very tightly. We need to write our specs in a way that gives those engineers some flexibility in design so that they can look at alternate materials that can deliver the same type of um, um, quality that you would get from um, the, the materials that you are currently using. And if there are alternative materials that are more readily available, you need to give those engineers the opportunity to build that into um, the designs that they're working on. So I think just that partnership and collaboration between the public and private sector is is really important. Um, in terms of, of um, trade secrets or change orders or things like that, you know, there there needs to be a paradigm shift. And um, you know, we've, we've got all this new money now coming from Washington, and if we don't do a good job of delivering um, more infrastructure for our dollar, um, then we're going to see that pool of money dry up on us. So I think the contractors should understand that it's in their own best interest going forward to, to become willing participants in those conversations. No, oh, awesome. No, great points. And thank you for sharing that. Now, another question, um, federal funding options, um, BABA, places further constraints in forecasting. Any insights on how these requirements are impacting the limiting pool for which can source projects. I don't know, if Mike or Ann, whoever wants to take that question. Yeah, I'll I'll take a a stab, a high level stab at this anyway. But um, I think Heather hits on on a very important point. Uh, sometimes we get in our own way, right? I mean, uh, the policy and law that I spoke to earlier, uh, they're all well intentioned, uh, not bad ideas, but they often don't meet the reality on the ground. Uh, I love uh, Buy America, the concept of it. Uh, let's return the American steel industry back to its its greatness. Uh, let's mm -hmm. use American steel to build all our projects. That's actually kind of a requirement. Uh, but then uh, the reality is the last integrated steel mill built in the United States was built in 1962. Um, and so, you know, the, the industry is, the steel industry is far behind the ability to, uh, actually source what the U.S. needs uh, for steel right now. And so, uh, you know, we have access to Canadian steel, uh, but you have to justify that, which is very difficult to do. Um, the, the competition between not only modes, we're talking transportation modes, but we're also talking construction modes, uh, really puts a lot of pressure on the American steel industry, which... Uh, I keep focusing on that because, uh, you know, bridges uh, require a lot of steel and bridges, uh, everybody wants the best one, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is some of our own policies and laws get in the way of that. And I think that there should be at least some exceptions that are a little bit uh, more flexible for those that have to construct and maintain these projects uh, in that in that regard. Um, so the we love the federal funding, but uh, some of the federal rules uh, are a little bit difficult to work with. And I, I don't think they meant them to be that way. Uh, but again, it's one of those things that when you get on the ground, it makes a huge difference. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. And, and I don't know if you want to add to anything that Mike said. Yeah, I did, just um, on the Build America, Buy America um, requirements. I, I think that they in DC. I think they're getting an understanding that that's that's a challenge, um, not only for the public sector but also for private sector infrastructure users and builders. So I think 
um, we've seen them try to, at least I know FTA, Federal Transit Administration has done this, that they, they've kind of put that on hold for a little bit, understand that, you know, the source may not just be there yet in the U.S. And so that they're going to have to figure out how to make, you know, those policy decisions now, but while trying to build up that capacity here in, in the country. Awesome. Thanks. Now, the next question, it's on cost estimation. How do you estimate construction costs for highway and bridge projects in the next few months without a crystal ball? Um, recently, they just had a low bid that came in at 27% over the cost estimate. So how can you predict cost estimates or best practices on that? So, uh, I feel your pain. Oops, sorry, Mike. <laughs> oh, you go ahead, Ann. No, um, so I, I have some public sector clients that I work with and trying to get projects um, implemented. And I just had a client that led a project and it came in 42% over the engineer's estimate. And it's a local government client, so they don't have the same flexibility as the state DOT. So they are in a position now where that project's on hold until we can identify the additional money um, to move that project forward. So it, it is your it is a conundrum. Um, and the ball is really gonna be helpful other than, you know, I think having, um, being able to leverage uh, points that we are collecting right now and hopefully state DOTs are, are um, savvy enough that um, they can start constructing um, models where they're looking at the, the trends currently and maybe figuring out looking by looking at data um, how they can maybe do a better job of getting closer to the mark. And it may not be when you get to the 100% design estimate to you know, take a second look at what those, what and, and readjust. And, you know, for, for my part, uh, this happened um, all the time. You, the uh, engineer's estimates uh, would be low for months and then they would be high for months because uh, you're looking at a few months worth of data to kind of predict what the next few months would be. And 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 the the transportation commission in particular was just uh, really upset about this. They thought uh, it refl it reflected badly on the engineer making the estimate when really they were doing the best they could with the data they had. And I think my suggestion in this case would be take a longer look uh, at the data, maybe uh, beyond a few months, maybe uh, look for previous historic trends. Um, this this has happened before in some cases. It'll happen again, um, and you can maybe project that way or introduce that factor in your projections and come in with the uh, with a with a closer estimate. You're you'll never get it right on, um, but uh, you, you don't also want uh, to keep having twenty seven percent over or under because that that is disruptive to any program. Mm -hmm. No, Man, it's, all, it's all about visibility and setting the right expectations, as, as Anne said previously as well. Yeah, no, definitely agree. And I think that's also another webinar topic that you can have all on its own. And that is it on questions, unless any more questions come in. But I want to thank our speakers. Thank you guys so much for all of your knowledge. And like we said, supply chains, as Mike mentioned, it's a giant web. So there's obviously no correct answer to how, like there's no magic solution to fix this, but it's just having visibility from end to end. And if that's it on questions, I want to wish everyone a great rest of the day. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye everybody. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you.